Hey, it's Teresa. Before we get started with this episode, I wanted to quickly tell you how Anchor by Spotify helps storytellers. Honestly, if I hadn't found Anchor, I'm not sure I would have even started this podcast. For the last year or so, I've recorded, edited, and shared more than 50 episodes on all the major platforms using Anchor. I use the same equipment that I record audiobooks on as a narrator, but you could record and edit a podcast right from your phone or computer using Anchor. They have everything you need. And best of all, Anchor by Spotify is totally free. So, if you know someone who has a story to tell, an idea to share, let them know they can download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Okay, let's get on with the episode. Thank you for listening. This is a story with skeletons in its closets. Secrets kept hidden. And a house that feels haunted. It won't stay painted. The shingles won't stay on. The lawn won't stay mowed. It's in a constant state of falling apart. Like it's grieving. Or possessed by ghosts. We're talking about Carrie Ann King's new novel, Improbably Yours. On this Desideratum. Desideratum is a Latin word. It means things that are desired as essential. This podcast celebrates storytelling as essential. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, showcasing the talents of my author and narrator friends. I hope you'll hear an artist you love or find your next favorite wordsmith. So, Improbably Yours begins with a memory. A young girl sitting with her grandmother, who, in fortune teller fashion, makes a prediction about the girl's future, involving a treasure hunt and an island. You'll hear that scene from the audiobook in just a few minutes. But first, let's listen to how Carrie played with the idea of hidden treasure, what's hidden below the surface with her characters. You're kind of playing with how things look on the surface. Like, for instance, when we first meet Blythe, who's our main character, her life looks like it has the markings of a happily ever after. Like, there's a lot of things on the surface that she should be really happy. Right. But she's not. Right. Well, because it's not her life. She's living the life that everybody else has planned for her, the, everybody else's version of a perfect life. And how many of us fall into that, right? Right. So one of my whole missions, and really at the heart, probably all of my books, are my characters looking to find their own real best life instead of the one that somebody else wants for them. Yes. Personal growth and personal discovery, but not just digging within yourself, but also sort of resisting the version maybe handed to you. you know, whoa, the version that, you know, everybody else has things that they want and they often project that on us so that's something I've always been really sensitive to as a human being is that projection when people see you in that you know how that is when somebody sees you in some way that is completely foreign to how you see yourself and you're like wait what <laughs> how, did you, how did you even get that <laughs> but there's good ways of doing that to people and ways that are not so good that's really what gaslighting is 
but then there's, you know, our, our parents and the people who love us who put those things on us because it's what they think, what they would like, what they want, and what they think should make us happy. But that's not what we want. And so mm. a lot of life is finding that out and being willing to set those boundaries and, you know, go for what it is that you really want, what your purpose is, what you're here for. So that's really Blythe's journey in this book. Well, so you just reminded me as you were talking that that's really a role that the grandmother in this story plays to kind of help her find herself, right? Yeah. So instead of being someone who's forcing something on her, she she also just has this great sense of play and wonder. Like we know the grandmother from childhood because she passes away when Blythe is really young. Yeah. But the relationship that you create there, you know, what was the inspiration for that? Where did you find that sort of magical grandmother granddaughter relationship you know honestly i think it's a relationship that i would have loved to have with the grandmother and it never did my grandmothers were both wonderful people um one lived far away and the other one was very very strict no nonsense you know cold oatmeal for breakfast depression era grandmother you don't throw anything away so i think i would have always liked a relationship with that and then I've been watching my friends and the relationships that they have with their granddaughters. I specifically am thinking of Maddie Dawson and Barbara O'Neill. Um, they have these wonderful, magical relationships with their granddaughters and they play and they draw pictures and they do art. And I'm just like, how wonderful and lovely would that be? So that's where that grew from. Oh, you know, it's funny because I started off reading it thinking kind of what you were saying is, oh, I wish I'd had. Wouldn't that have been nice? But what you you just turned that on its head by saying, you could do that. You could create that in your life. You can, absolutely. And, and I've seen it. And it's a, you know, it's a beautiful and wonderful thing. I love that. That's a good place to pause. Before we start talking about the island and the haunted house, let's listen to that scene from the audiobook with Blythe and her grandmother. You should know, Brilliance Audio has produced Improbably Yours in a dual narrator format. So when you hear about Blythe, it's audiobook actress Terry Clark Linden, an Earphones award-winning narrator who's performed some of Carrie's other books. Then when you hear about the other main character, Flynn, the Viking, yes, a Viking. We'll talk about him in a few minutes. In the audiobook, Flynn is narrated by Aaron Shedlock, who is the voice of several national and international commercial brands, and he's a rising star in the world of audiobooks. Right now, the scene you're going to hear is from the beginning of the book, when the grandmother makes a prediction and a promise to young Blythe. This is from Improbably Yours, written by Carrie Ann King. The narrator here is Terry Clark Linden. Mom says magic isn't real. She says a girl turning six is too big to believe in such foolishness. Nomi says it's not foolishness at all, and what Mom doesn't know won't hurt her. I'm going with what Nomi says, at least while I'm at her house. She makes it easy to believe our games of let's pretend are real. She looks just like a storybook fortune teller with her bright colored turban and the golden hoops dangling from her ears. Silver bracelets clink on her wrists when she moves. I'm dressed up too, in one of Nomi's silken nightgowns, my wild red hair covered by a scarf. Between us on the tea table sits Nomi's big snow globe, pretending to be a crystal ball. She has been gazing into it, looking for my fortune, long enough for me to drain a cup of milky tea and finish every crumb on my plate. Now I can't wait another single minute. What do you see? Tell me, tell me, I say, bouncing up and down in my chair. Nomi frowns but doesn't look up. Seeing the future is not like turning on the television. Hush now, be patient. She shakes the globe, the snow swirling up into a small blizzard. 
her eyes narrow. Ah, there you are, she says in a different sort of voice. I stare as hard as I can, but all I see is the swirl of snow and my own face, all twisted and strange in the curving glass. I put both hands over my mouth to keep from spilling out my questions and breaking the magic. I see you surrounded by water. Am I swimming? I lean forward with my nose almost touching the globe, trying to see what Nomi sees. You are not swimming. You are on an island. You are searching for something. Like Treasure Island, you mean? I'm hunting for treasure, right? When do I start? Hush now, Nomi says again. Let me focus. She turns the globe slightly, her bracelets clinking. I see a birthday cake. I am counting the candles. That means another birthday. Today I am six, and I'm right here with Nomi, so maybe it will be next year when I'm seven. Or even when I'm ten, although ten is so old, it's almost impossible to imagine even for me, and I'm a pretty good imaginer. There are, oh my stars, there are thirty candles, Nomi says. Thirty, I squeal, but I'll be old. Thirty is too old to go treasure hunting. Thirty is a perfect age, she says the age for finding yourself. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Vinland. <laughs> this is the resort island where Blythe has to go. You're basing it loosely on Viking mythology, but it's also sort of shamelessly touristy mixed with pirate lore to attract a tourist. So again, not quite what it is. On the, like the surface is really funny. Uh, exactly, which is what my character Flynn just absolutely hates this. Poor, poor Flynn. He's a genuine treasure hunter and he believes in historical accuracy. He has been called back to the island that he left as a child because his sister has died and he needs to take care of his orphan niece, Savannah. Flynn has to then participate in this whole touristy mishmash of pirates and Vikings and schmaltz, really. <laughs> He's not happy about any of it. But, you know, it, it's if you go to any little touristy kind of place, it, it can be very like that. And I don't think I've really pushed the envelope on, you know, what those tourist places are like. No, and matter of fact, I really, I still really found this place very alluring. <laughs> Despite the sheen of tourism that you put on it, there's also something really attractive to me about getting on a ferry and, and being dropped off somewhere that's, I don't know, the isolation of it and the fact that it's centered around an experience. Sure, absolutely. And so, okay, first of all, who doesn't want to go be on an island where you're involved in a treasure hunt and that's the reason for going? Yeah, yeah. And then from the minute you step on the little ferry, which is your only way to get there, you have to get into the fun of it. It's like Halloween, you know, you're going to be a pirate or you're going to be a Viking and you're going to play a game and it's just, I, I want to go. Yeah. So where did you get the idea for this? Is this just something that you're thinking, oh, I'd really... Wouldn't that be fun? Or did you have some similar experience? I, I have not really had a similar experience. I, you know, I went on a cruise I, and the cruise ship is kind of like that in some ways. The setting is really, that's really fun. It also isn't just exactly what it appears on the surface. No. <laughs> you have a house that's in a constant state of needing to be repaired. And um, there is a Viking. There is a Viking. You mentioned Flynn a little bit. He's our other main storyteller here. He has kind of a another parallel story happening with Blythe. He's also kind of stuck in what, or not stuck, but the way that I felt about Blythe having this, her life, the way it looks on the surface versus kind of what she's really seeking. He also sort of has that going on. Like from the surface, it's like, oh, he's running a treasure island. It looks like it should be amazing, but there's other things going on with him under the surface. 
there's a, there's a lot going on under the surface and I don't want to give much of that away. So, you know, Flynn left the island for very, very good reasons and did not want to ever come back for very good reasons. But it was good for him. He's being forced now to kind of confront what happened in his past to maybe revise his thoughts about what happened and his childhood and, you know, why he left. And um, it's good for him. Not to mention Blythe being good for him also. Yes. I like the way from the very first time Blythe meets him, you know, he he dives into the water to save an, a dog that's gone overboard and he comes out of the water and you just, you write these descriptions of how, <laughs> how Viking he is. I thought that was fantastic. I've heard you say and refer to a Viking in your life. <laughs> and so I thought that was kind of funny knowing that about you, how you wrote this character. Yeah, yeah, I do have one of those. He's older now than Flynn in the story, but definitely still a Viking. So Viking, people always ask why my Viking is called the Viking. You know, he's big, he's a little blustery, he can come across as uh, difficult. But inside, he's all soft and melty and takes care of people and small animals and things. So, yeah. That is one of the things that's most attractive about Flynn is that he's a protector. Yeah. That when it comes down to it, this sense of like, I, I will be there for you. I would do anything for you. Absolutely. One of his big jobs on the island is he runs the metal detector. Right. Yes phase of searching for clues. Mm -hmm. And I personally have never used a metal detector, but I think they're really alluring, like this idea that they could help you see things that you can't see with the naked eye under the surface. Yes. It's really cool. So have you used one? Yes. And the thing is, we uh, we had one around the house that was not very good. And I always thought it was fun, although we never really found anything. And then we bought a good one when I started writing this book and discovered that it's much harder to operate than you would expect Oh, to, you know, use it properly and to actually locate and pinpoint and all that kind of stuff. So that was why I had Flynn actually teach the class which is based on the instructions from a book that I bought for how to use your treasure hunting device accurately and well. I can't remember the last time I even thought about a metal detector actually, but there's something, there's something very alluring about them. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's that whole finding what is beyond your, the reach of your visible senses. You know, we, I love to reach for what I can't see, touch, hear, smell, taste. What's out there that I'm not aware of? One time that really struck me was weirdly enough bird watching. I'm not really into bird watching, but I went bird watching with some friends and they were looking for little teeny tiny Orioles, I believe. Through the binoculars, all of a sudden you're seeing these things that you normally didn't even know were there and they're tiny and beautiful. And so it's you know, that kind of everyday magic. Yeah, that's a great description that binoculars are another way that we sort of heighten one of our senses. Yeah. Absolutely. Microscopes, prisms, you know, I'm very, very fond of all of these things. Yeah. Well, I'm actually, I'm glad you brought up birds because in my notes, I was like, let's talk about the ravens. <laughs> oh yeah. I love the raven. Um, so for starters, ravens really are incredible birds. They can live for 30 years. Oh, wow. They're probably as smart as a three or four year old child. They can learn words. They can learn to talk like parrots, you know? So they're very cool. And also they're just so mystical. You know, ravens, they have this mythology to them that they come from the underworld, that they also go beyond the surface of things. Plus my Viking has a wild raven that he feeds <laughs> on a regular basis. It comes around. Your actual Viking in your life. My actual viking in real life yeah so we have a cat who's an inveterate hunter and was always killing all these little critters and we didn't want the dog eating them so the viking would go outside find the dead rodent and fling it over the fence well as the raven caught on to this so this we have lots of ravens but there's one that is bigger he's huge so um the viking made a little platform on the fence it's like a little offering altar where he would then lay the little dead critters and wait for the 
Raven to come get them. Sometimes we see him come get them. Usually they just vanish. It's he's kind of sketchy. He doesn't he, we keep hoping he'll get friendly, but that hasn't happened. Well, I think the Raven there is a Raven in this story and I also think it's one of the atmospheric things you do, you know. You're not really sure in this story throughout the whole thing the reader's not really sure where magic is happening. Like you do a really good job of having things be well, that's explainable, but is it? Is that explainable? Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad that came off because I was aiming for that. Even with the house. And the improbable house really is a character in this book. And I realized the other day that the house actually was what came to me first with this story before all of the other pieces. I sat down and scribbled something about the house would not stay painted the shingles would not stay on. No matter how many times we mowed the grass, it refused to stay mowed. Everything actually, Blythe came after that, the treasure hunt came after that, everything came after the house. That's so interesting. Well, I like the idea of the house sort of holding on to things from the past. Houses Houses do, though. I mean, a, a house that has been neglected for even a month, everybody's moved out, it starts to fall apart. It's very interesting. You can almost, there's a feeling, improbable house is grieving and it, you know, there you go. Yeah, it's grieving. That's a great word for it. It really is. It's, it's grieving to the point that it refuses to get over it. Yeah, 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 it, it refuses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I like that. Even the word improbable, like I actually went and looked up, not likely to be true, not likely to happen is the definition of improbable. Yes. Everything is just a little bit improbable, but remembering that improbable is not impossible. The island is improbable. Blythe thought this island was, she drew a map of this island as a six-year-old child. She didn't think it was real. All of that's improbable, and yet it actually exists. So I was thinking about all the improbable things in this story, but that's true. The very, at the very beginning, we know that she's drawn this treasure map sort of in a moment of, of creativity and magic with her grandmother. <laughs> And then it comes back to her in this inheritance. It's not impossible. No. I think that's my favorite part of what you just said is that improbable is not impossible. Yeah. I like things that are improbable. (laughs) I love it when the improbable happens. And it happens a lot, you know. Yeah, I love that. Um, Okay. So let me check my notes. You've put something fun together for, for your readers with your own version of kind of a treasure map. And um, what I like is that this leads readers to a really rich community that maybe not everybody knows about because these are all, every stop on this treasure map, every place you want to visit to get clues is part of Bookstagram. Yeah, there's a treasure hunt in the book. I love treasure hunts, so why not do a treasure hunt? To have a bunch of Bookstagram stops where Um, readers need to go to each one and collect a clue word and then present them all to me at the end for a chance to win some prizes. I think I read that you were going to do one of yours as a t-shirt, right? I did. I created a Vinland t-shirt. It has the world tree. It has a raven. It has a picture of probably yours. Um, It's cool. And then I actually found this lovely little pendant that's a world tree with um, a couple little ravens sitting in it. Um, The other fun thing I did besides the treasure hunt is I have for book clubs. I actually, if you go to my website, you will find a, a download that you can get that has some suggested drinks and questions to bring to your book club. So that's a great idea for me when I've read a good book that has made me think or laugh or feel something, I do want to talk about it with other people. And that's really the heart of what a book club is, right? It it draws people together in community to talk and share about books. That's a great other component because you're drawing people to the social media world of that, but also in your own neighborhood book club or online book club. 
Yeah, you're not new to this. <laughs> no, no, this is book 13. It's actually kind of fun because it comes out just before Halloween on October 18. And it is my 13th published novel. So lucky 13. Lucky 13. <laughs> yeah, with some spooky elements for sure. <laughs> Thanks to Carrie and her publisher, Lake Union, and the audiobook publisher, Brilliance Audio. You can find links to the narrator's websites and Carrie's website in the show notes. I'd love to know what you think about the book. Reach out anytime on social media or by email. I'm tbnarrator at gmail.com. As always, thanks for being here, and thanks for listening. <laughs>